married brother, but I just met him a little while ago. So I'm going to let him introduce himself and his lovely wife and uh, tell us what, what's going on in their life uh, as it relates to their calling uh, to children. So God bless you, Joe. You come. Well, thank you for inviting us into your church. Thanks for letting Callie and I come. I know I've met lots of you, but just for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Joe. This is my wife, Callie. We've been married for four months now. We grew up in church together, and then started dating when I went to college, and then just recently got married. If you don't mind, I would love to play the video first, because it will give a couple of the things uh, that we're planning to do in Chile, so you can hear that from our video, see some of the pictures and places we saw. We visited there a couple of years ago, and then I'll jump up here and tell you a little bit more about it. We'll see if we can get the sound to work. It was working just a little bit earlier, but it's not now, obviously. So let me tell you something about Chile while we're seeing the video we'll play. Like I said, Hallie and I visited Chile a couple of years ago. And I was there for six weeks and studied the language while I was down there. They speak Spanish. It's kind of like a southern Spanish. You know, Hallie and I grew up in the south, so we're kind of used to this. But just like in the south, we use kind of slang terms and say things kind of in a different way. In Chile, they usually mix up the Spanish and kind of butcher the language a lot. <laughs> they use lots of euphemisms and things like that that make it hard for foreigners to learn. So we visited there for a couple of weeks. And you may be thinking, well, how do you end up going to Chile? Let me tell you the story real briefly. When I was 12 years old, I had already seen Christ when I was nine. And at the age of 12, I said, God, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. I picked up globe and I spun it, and my finger landed on Chile. <laughs> so at the time, I was thinking, you know, there, there's no way that God is calling me to be a missionary in Chile just by spinning the globe. And as I grew my walk with God, I began to read God's word every day. And as I did that, just seeing God's word, He began to burn my heart for lost people, specifically for the people of Chile. His missionaries would come to our church. He would remind me of His call to Chile. He put a missionary in my life who was a missionary to Chile, and it just seemed so ironic that it was really God's plan putting a missionary in my life who was already working in Santiago, their capital city. That missionary, a couple years later, invited me to intern with him for six weeks, and so I flew down to Chile, saw some of the people, the places, the church plants that are currently in that city, and met several of the missionaries. Hallie came to visit me for 10 days, or just day at the time. We came back. Finished up our years at Pensacola Christian College for Bible College and just got married a couple months ago. So in the meantime, while we're trying to raise support to go back to Chile to work with some church planners to learn the language, to plant our own church, we are currently working with my pastor, Pastor Lauren Revere, actually pastor here in Indiana for a while. That's where you met him, is that right, Pastor? And so Pastor Revere has been our pastor for about 10 years and I'm interning with him. Callie is teaching first grade at our Christian school, and that will keep us busy for the first year. After the first year, we're going to start the education full-time. We're already doing it part-time, but we'll start full-time raising support, and then hopefully we will be in Chile in the summer of 2023. Is the video going to work or not? I don't, we can try it. Yeah, it, it probably won't because it looks like the sound. I don't know if I messed something up on the laptop, so I apologize for No, that. that's fine. <laughs> Yeah. I would be glad to take some questions. Let me tell you just a little bit more about Chile that we have in the video. And if you have a question, I'd be glad to take it real quick before we jump into our sermon. Um, Chile is a very long country. You may recognize it on the globe. It's just a really skinny country, and it's just so long and skinny. It's bordered by the Andes Mountains, so it, it, it 
cuts off this, the country of Chile from the, from the rest of the continent in South America. Because of this, they've got the Atacama Desert, the desert region in the north, and then in the middle, there's just kind of the agricultural area. The vineyards that they're known for, Santiago is known for its wine, which is not a great thing. It's, it's hard to teach a church not to drink alcohol when they grow up in such a culture like that. And then the, the southern part is the farmland, and the very tip, the bottom tip, is the Patagonia region. It's close to Antarctica, and so it's frozen, um, and lots of forest as well. That city of Santiago is a massive city. It's almost the size of Atlanta, in, as far as geography. But Atlanta, having one million people, Santiago has seven million in the city. And so there's so many people who are unreached. They predominantly are Catholics, and then Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons are becoming a fast-growing religion. So it's hard because they don't believe in Christ, or that Christ is God, and that Christ really did die for our sins. So when we present Christ to them, they, they're receptive, but they're confused, and they don't understand that Christ really is the answer to pay for their sins. You know, I put my faith in Jesus Christ when I was nine, knowing that I'm a sinner, I need salvation. I'm going to hell because of my sin. And Jesus Christ came to earth, lived a perfect life, and he died to pay for my sin. And that's the gospel. He rose again, defeated death, and we want to share that with the people in Santiago. Is the video not going to work? <laughs> okay. Well, then, let me jump into the sermon. But before I do that, I did want to play a violin special. open up to Matthew 22. Matthew 22 is the passage for today. Now as you're opening up to Matthew 22, we're going to read the last couple of verses in the chapter. But how many of you know that the golden rule is kind of hard to practice in our lives. I mean, we all know the golden rule. We grew up learning it in school. I was homeschooled and my mom taught it to me. The golden rule that says, do 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the verse that, that teaches us this is in Matthew 22, verse 39. It says, uh, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Something Jesus said, the golden rule comes from the Bible. That principle is something we learn in Matthew 22. But how many of you know that it's actually pretty hard to do that in our lives? It's hard to love as itself. I've, as I've told all of you, we've only been married four months. And so I don't claim, claim to be a, an expert on marriage. But I have noticed a couple things. And one of those things is that sometimes I want Hallie to do something for me rather than loving her as myself. I want her to love me as I would desire. I'll think some things like this. Uh, I hope Hallie will come home and do the dishes when she gets back. Or I hope she'll clean up the living room because I've made a mess and I don't want to clean it up. Or something like maybe she'll notice all the good things I do for her and compliment me for it. But how many of you husbands know that this is actually God giving us the perfect opportunity to show our wives that we love her as we love ourselves? You know, if I want Hallie to do the dishes for me, then God's reminding me that I should do the dishes for Hallie. Now, I don't always do well with this. Frequently, I leave the dishes for her to come home and do it. And so we're going to learn how to do better with it in Matthew 22. Matthew 22 is a passage that teaches us that God is wanting us to show love to the world. And the specific idea that we should, we should be focusing in on in this passage is that God wants us to take the principle of loving others and to work it out in our lives, to put it to work in our lives. So let me read Matthew 22, and actually before we jump into it, let me, let me tell you the beginning of the passage. Jesus is being asked several questions by the Pharisees, by lawyers, by Sadducees, and he answers each one by using God's word. The first question he's asked is about paying taxes. And they ask him, should they pay their taxes to Caesar, or should they rebel against Caesar and pay their taxes to God? And Jesus tells them that simply, they should pay to Caesar what's Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Then they go to the next question, halfway through Matthew chapter 22. And they, they give Jesus this scenario. If seven men all marry the same woman, and they consecutively pass away before the next one married her, till the very end where each of them passed away, whose wife would she be in eternity? And it's a, it's a good question. And Jesus simply says that there's no marriage in heaven, and that that's not something they should be concerned about. Then he comes to the third question. And this question isn't necessarily a question that's pointed at Jesus to trip him up. It seems, seems to me, at least, that it's a question of his values. As you understand God's word, we know that Jesus is the one who wrote God's word. So what is the way that Jesus interprets it? How does he value God's word? It's a, it's a question about his judgment. So we come to Matthew 22, verse 34, and I'm going to read verses 34 through 40. You can follow along as I do. Matthew 22, verse 34 says, When the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and said, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So in this passage, Jesus is kind of giving us like two pieces to a wrench. You know, have you used the socket wrench? It's got it's got the handle, and then it's got the, the socket as well. You know, attach both, and it, it works perfectly. It's a great tool for taking out bolts. And if you don't have both parts of the tool, it obviously doesn't work. Am I right? You know, if you have just the handle, then you have all the leverage, the power, the strength, the grip, but you can't actually grip onto that bolt. You can't actually get any, any tension on it because it's just the handle. But if you just have the socket that you put on the bolt, it grips the bolt, but it, it can't have enough power, it can't get enough strength or leverage on it to, to turn that bolt. And so that is somewhat of an illustration of this passage. God's given us two parts to loving others or, or to showing love. And the first one is love God. The second one is love others. As we love God, it's the power and strength that we need to fulfill all the commandments in the Bible. 
That's what Jesus tells us in Matthew 22. But then loving others is the way we practically show our love for God. In fact, the Bible even says that if we don't love others, then we don't love God. So let's look at the first point, love God. This is in verses 37 through 38. I'm going to read those again. It says, in verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So it's the first commandment. It's, it's the number one priority. It's the first in line. The totality of our purpose in life should be summed up in, in loving God. We can fulfill all the commandments in Scripture if we just fulfill this commandment to love God. One of the authors that I was studying said this, The care of your heart should be set upon nothing so much as upon the loving and pleasing of God. I'm sure you've read Revelation 2, 4. I'm going to flip over there and read it for you. Revelation 2, verse 4, that, that passage is John the Apostle writing to several churches. And he's writing to the Ephesus church here specifically, and he commends them for all the good things they're doing. They're doing so many things in the church. They're serving. They are rejecting false prophets. They are doing so many things that please the Lord. But he comes to Revelation 2, verse 4, and it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. We ought to love God first. This is the first commandment to love God. That would be our number one priority, especially for those of us as Christians. God has saved us from our sins. And 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us. We shouldn't just love God to love him. We shouldn't just serve in church just to serve. Just as the Ephesus Church in Revelation was doing so many good things, but they had lost for the Bible even says they left, neglected their first love. When I was thinking about illustrations of someone being devoted to God, sticking with their first love, there's several people that come to my mind from, from the Bible. And King David is one of them. But then as I thought further about those who had left their first love, King David is also one of those who neglected his first love. I mean, you remember the Bible. He married Michael, his first wife, Saul's daughter. Shortly after marrying Michael, he married another wife, and then another. And I think seven marriages later, he had an affair with Bathsheba and married her later on as well. And at this point, he's gone so far away from his first love, Michael, that you couldn't even begin to call him devoted to him. He completely left his first love. Do we look like that as Christians sometimes? When our relationship with God mm -hmm. looks like we've neglected it, like we care about everything else in the world, but loving and pleasing God. Maybe our Bible reading is the last thing on our list, or spending time with God in prayer is just not something we do consistently. Or maybe we're just so focused on money, career, wealth, whatever it is, I know that I can be this way, and I can leave my first love. And the Bible's telling us that the first commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. It's not just the first commandment, though. The Bible says it's the first and great commandment. It's great because it's weighty. No one claimed it was going to be easy. It takes work. It's difficult to love God with all of our heart. It takes lots of effort. Matthew Henry, in describing this, said, Loving God with all the power of your soul. It says that's what we ought to be doing. It's, it's the great commandment. We have to love God with all the power of our soul. What do we do that doesn't please God? If we're supposed to be loving Him, then what is it that we do that takes away from our love for God? What is it that's hindering our relationship with God? I know there's several things in my life. This is a foundational commandment. If we were to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, we would be unable to sin. Now think about that. Isn't that true? If we really did love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, we wouldn't be able to sin. I mean, think of maybe a murderer who's, who's murdered somebody. He wouldn't have been able to harbor the hatred in his heart to murder someone if he was so full of love for God. If he was so focused on that. Maybe consciousness. I would have no desire for other things if all I wanted in life was with God. Isn't that right? That if we really love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, 
we wouldn't struggle with any of the sins and forgetting any of the commandments that God's given us in His Word. Even in losing our love for others, then if we focus on God, the love for others will come as well. This is why the first commandment, loving God with our heart, soul, and mind, this is why it's the first and great commandment. It's the wrench. It's all the leverage. It gives us all the power to show the love of God. When we truly love God, He gives us the strength to fulfill all the other commandments that we read in the Scripture. But then He gives us the second commandment as well, loving others. A man came in to Starbucks to pick up his order. He walked in without a mask as well. He began talking to the barista in a thick southern accent. He slowly explained how he wanted this certain drink. And he tried to order it and didn't go through. He said, it wasn't on the to-go order. She said to him that he could order a cash register, but he still stood there, stumbling through his words, trying to communicate to her. The barista recognized this man's desire and said, Sir, did you want the Starbucks app that you were not able to order? He said, Yes, ma'am, I would. And she took his order, quickly made the drink, gave it to him, and if I'm not wrong, that customer is going to come back to that Starbucks, won't he? She was such a loving barista, or such a loving um, worker, that she would commit so much time and effort to understanding what this man wanted. And even someone here, like this barista who may or may not have been saved, she even showed the love of Christ, didn't she? Just by demonstrating her love for this random customer. Loving others is the practical way that we show our love for God. There's two ways we can love others. First, we encourage Christians. The second way is to evangelize unbelievers. So when we're encouraging Christians to show our love for others, this is probably the easier of the two. A lot of us see fellow Christians at church. Hallie and I see fellow Christians at every single church we've been to. And we know Christians at our workplaces. We know Christians are their best friends. We see them all over the place. We have fellowship with them. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we don't know too many who have not received Christ. And we've got to be careful of that because it's, we've got to be intentional to go and meet the unbelievers. But the fellow Christians, we see them all the time. And it's a perfect opportunity for us to invest that time into them. This principle is the principle of discipling. You could call that doing intentional spiritual good in the life of a believer to point them to God. For many of us, it's way easier to love others that are Christians and to show that love for them. And because we have so many interactions with them, we should be using each of those to point them closer to God. Galatians 6.10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them who are of the household of faith. We should be encouraging Christians at every step and every time we see them. You know, it's, we may think it's not a big deal if we gossip about this. Or if we have this, this conversation is necessary about this person. And I fall into that trap of thinking we need to talk about a specific thing that a specific person is doing wrong. And it's not true. Gossip is never showing the love of God. If we really do love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, then we'll show it by loving others. Maybe God is giving us an opportunity to do good to all men by keeping our mouths shut and not saying what we should say. Maybe He's giving us this opportunity to actually open our mouth to say something really encouraging that someone's been needing to hear. There's lots of things that we need to be doing as Christians to encourage other Christians. And there's so many commandments in the Bible of fulfilling this commandment to love God. But it starts with simply loving God, then loving others. The second way is to evangelize unbelievers. You can turn to John 13, 34 through 35. I'm just going to read these verses real quickly. John 13, verses 30, 34 through 35. It says, A new commandment I give unto you. This is Jesus talking. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I love you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Yep, one, love one to another. This is the hard part because a lot of us don't have very many connections with unbelievers. Some of us, because of work, because of friends, because of the places we live, have lots of these connections, and that's phenomenal. Any unbeliever that we don't know is an opportunity to share the love of Christ with someone who doesn't know about it. 
Isn't that right? And so the one we know these other leaders, that's, that's great. But I know that for me, it's easy to be in Christian circles and to have no connection with other leaders who need the gospel. And we sing about the gospel and sharing the news, but it's impossible to share it if we don't know any unbelievers. And so this is the harder part for me, and maybe for you as well, evangelizing unbelievers because I just don't even know enough. And so I'm trying to meet more of them. Sharing the gospel is the essence of loving others. You know, Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sins. In fact, John 13, John 3, 6, Excuse me. You know what verse I'm trying to say. John 3, 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, even in John 3, 16, God's saying that he sent his Son because he loved the whole world. God loves all unbelievers and all believers. So we ought to be loving them in the same way. Now think about this. Going back to the golden rule, or verse 39, Matthew 22, 39, where Jesus says, I shall love thy neighbor as thyself. If we really love our neighbors, our unsaved neighbors as ourselves, then we want them to have the gospel. I've been so blessed to be taught the gospel and to receive Christ and to have salvation that if I don't share that with others, then I'm not loving others as myself. I'm keeping this blessing for myself and I'm content to be a Christian and not pass that on to others. That's unbelievable that I would have so much love and grace given to me by God and keep it to myself and not love others as myself. The essence of loving others is sharing the gospel. God loved us so much and he loves Carmel, Indiana, Indianapolis, this whole area so much. He died on the cross for us. He died on the cross for the people in Chile as well. And that's why we want to share the gospel of my church in Chile. Last passage I'm going to have you turn to. Go to Luke 10, 27. Luke 10, 27. This is a parallel passage to what we're reading today, Matthew 22. And Jesus asked, was asked a question by another lawyer. So I'm going to start reading in verse 26. Uh, actually, I'm going to jump to verse 25, Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Then in Luke 10, 26, he says, He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own, own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He has showed mercy on him, but Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. And Jesus is telling us the same, Go and do thou likewise. Show love to your neighbors. Obviously, those three men probably would have claimed to love others, right? The Levite and the priest probably both would have said, We love others. We love the people of Israel. We love all kinds of people. But when it came right down to it, they passed on the other side, leaving this man stranded, dying. The Samaritan was the one who actually showed his love for God. The Samaritan was the one who had a real relationship with God, so that when he saw the need of another person, he met it. 
He didn't just say, I love God, and I'm going to pass by this person, like the priest and the Levite did. He showed practically, with this man laying on the ground, how he loved God by meeting the needs of this person. We ought to meet the needs of the people in our communities as well. We should meet their physical needs, and maybe that's by being a friend, by preparing a meal, by doing something for those people who are unsafe in our community, who need us to meet their needs. But then we should meet their, their spiritual needs as well by sharing the gospel with them. So I guess the question is, who do you know that doesn't know Jesus that you can share this with? Who can you target with your love from God so that they'll see Jesus through you? Who can you share the gospel with? So take this principle and let's put it to work in our lives. Let's not just think about the golden rule, but let's remember that the golden rule comes from the Bible. Jesus gave us the, the principle of the golden rule, but he also gave us the key to it, to love God and then to love others. We can't get it backwards. We have to love God first. So take time with God each day, reading His Word, spending time in prayer, devoting time to our first love, and then devote time to loving others as well. Loving God gives us all the power. Remember, it's like that wrench handle. You get all the leverage and power from the handle. But then loving others is just like that socket. It's the practical way to work out the love of God. It grips that nut. It, it puts some of the leverage and strength onto the bolt so you can actually make this wrench work. Same with loving God and loving others. When we love God, it gives us the strength. When we love others, it gives us the, the grip, the practical way of showing our love to the world and by sharing the gospel with them. Paul Tenhagen is the mayor of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He's also a vibrant believer. When he was a local businessman, he felt a persistent inner prompting to run for office. He ran for mayor and won. Recently, Ted Hagen said, Everybody, Christian or not, wants a leader with a core set of beliefs, a leader of character. I believe I've gotten to the point with people where they realize Paul is an outspoken Christian, but that doesn't mean that he's going to bring hate to our city. He's a compassionate leader. The only way to get past that is by seeing your actions. Now, people are saying, Okay, maybe this guy isn't so bad after all. He's a Christian giving out free bus rides to the poor in our city. And then Mayor Paul Tendaken says at the end, I'm a man of faith. That's where my heart is. I like that people know that about me. We should be showing the love of God by loving others. This is the principle of Matthew 22. God wants us to take this principle to make it work in our lives, not to just love God and spend all our time in church and reading our Bible, but then work that out practically by witnessing to the lost, by evangelizing unbelievers, uh, by fulfilling the songs that we sang today, by taking the gospel to others, and Hallie and I hope to do that by planting churches in Chile. Now I said I was going to take some questions. Let me pray and then I'll do that. Lord, thank you very much for your word. Thank you for this passage and teach us more about love. And Lord, thank you for the, the members, the Christians we've been able to meet this morning. Lord, thank you that we were able to draw close to you in your word. And I pray that you would give us the strength and give us the persistence to love others, to share the gospel with them. In your name I pray, amen. Okay, if anyone does have a question about Chile, I would love to answer it for you. I've only been there for about six weeks. So if I don't know the answer, I apologize. Yes, yes sir. Nate Saint went to the Alpha Indians. Yes, sir. Now, one of his relatives are in Chile. Do you know them? Is that... Saint? Is his name Nate Saint as well? No, his name is not Nate, but he's a relative of Nate Saint. <laughs> he's, he's under BIM, I believe. I, I think I've heard his name, but I'm not better than him. No. I'll have to look for him. <laughs> I think he's in the same city. Yes, sir. I think there are only a few missionaries down there, but this time, there were only two. Yes, Envision Baptist Missions, based out of Alpharetta, they've sent another three or four just recently. And so there is now a group of missionaries working together in Santiago. I think I mentioned, but our plan is to work with one of these missionaries who's been there for 18 years. His name is Jason Holt. And he's already planted three churches, starting on the next one. 
and they'll set us up with a language school. For 20 hours a week, we'll study with a Chilean, and then for 20 hours, we'll interact with Chileans in the evening to have, um, I guess, more informal training. And we'll learn as fast as we can. We'll intern with Jason Holt, and then we'll start out after that playing our own church. I'll have to keep an eye out for it, though. <laughs> yes? This is kind of a crazy question, but is it weather down there in the office of the Mars? It is. It is, but, you know, Alan and I grew up in Georgia, and it's actually just the flip side of Georgia. The weather is um, similar, the climate is similar. Um, they have winter and the summer, obviously, but it only gets as cold as it does in Georgia. <laughs> um, the only downside is that in Chile, they have less heating and air. <laughs> So it's a little bit more drastic, I guess, but um, they do use pro, uh, propane heaters, and they don't really have air conditioning, yeah. which I guess would be fun for us. <laughs> we'll get used to it. Will you have to be mainly in the city or the outskirts? In the city. Santiago is a capital city, and it's, it's massive, and it's very well developed. They're actually the most economically stable country in South America as of now. We'll see if that continues. But because of that, it's comparable to Atlanta with um, having lots of convenience as far as Walmart and things like that. We're hoping to start out there where the other missionaries are, and then the Lord may open doors to other cities. La Paraito is a city just two hours to the coast, and Vina del Mon is right next to it. Neither of them have a church in the city, and a Bible believing church at least. And so that may be where the Lord's leading us after we get set up. Come up here and 